My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Executive Director of the Congregational Library and Archives in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to today's virtual discussion with Dr. Sarah Giorgini to celebrate the paperback release of her wonderful book, Household Gods, The Religious Lives of the Adams Family. To begin with, I want to acknowledge that the Congregational Library and Archives resides in what is now known as Boston, which is in the place of the Blue Hills, the homeland of the Massachusetts people, whose relationships and connections with this land continue to this day and into the future. For those joining us for the first time, the Congregational Library and Archives is an independent research library. Established in 1853, the Congregational Library's mission is to foster a deeper understanding of the spiritual, intellectual, cultural, and civic dimensions of the congregational story and its ongoing relevance in the 21st century. We do this through free access to our li research library of 225,000 books, pamphlets, periodicals, and manuscripts, and our digital archive, which has more than 100,000 images, many drawn from our New England's Hidden Histories project. Throughout the year, we offer educational programs and research fellowships for students, scholars, churches, and anyone interested in Congregationalism's influence on the American story. Please do check back on our website, congregationallibrary.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. Dr. Sarah Giorgini, originally from Brooklyn, New York, earned her doctorate in history from Boston University. She is series editor for the papers of John Adams, part of the Adams editorial project based at our wonderful neighbor, just about a mile away, the Massachusetts Historical Society here in Boston. And she's also a member of the board of directors of the Congregational Library and Archives. She is involved in many history organizations, and I was a little blown away looking at all the things that she does. Uh, and I just wanted to give uh, a shout out to a few of them. She's involved with the New England Quarterly, the American Historical Association, the White House Historical Association, the Association of Documentary Editing, and is currently the president of the, excuse me, the Society for U.S. Intellectual History. Uh, Sarah, I, I don't know how you do it all, <laughs> but it is incredibly impressive. And thank you uh, for the service. I mean, it's it's your work as a public historian and as a research scholar that really allows us to really understand the past in its full complexity. But none of you have come here tonight to hear me rattle on. You've here, come here to learn more about the Adams family. So, Dr. Giorgini, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Kyle, and thank you to everyone in the CLA community far and wide tuning in. It's always a pleasure to reconnect with reading room texts and friends that really shape scholarship, and that's the case here tonight. Tonight, I'd like to reintroduce you to a really remarkable local family, the Adamses of Quincy, Massachusetts, and they might be slightly familiar to you but we're about to make them a little bit strange and a little bit more interesting. We'll see how their religious journeys transformed what they did for the nation. And we'll kind of walk through some of the experiences and ideas that they encountered over three centuries worth of religion at home and abroad. So the Adamses lived at the heart of political power for over a century. Their archive held here in the Massachusetts Historical Society and the Adams Family Papers spills over with love letters and state secrets and everything in between. By reading their diaries and correspondence, we can start to hear the soundtrack of nation building. A revolution becomes a republic, colonists become citizens and a civil war looms ever closer. So what kind of religion did the Adams family develop and use to guide some of those really big changes? Household Gods looks at this very famous first family and asks, what did they think religion was good for? So one manuscript set my entire book in motion. When I first came to the Adams Papers, one of my first jobs was transcription. And this is really the most important thing we do. We look at the original manuscript and we render the exact text of the author with all of its grammatical quirks and funny misspellings and odd bits of punctuation so that we can build an authoritative transcription for scholars to use in sight. And so the first time I met John Adams, he was the cranky Yankee of July 1812, who was just renewing his correspondence with 
other revolutionaries like Benjamin Rush and soon Thomas Jefferson. And I had the great good fortune to transcribe this letter that John Adams wrote. And here he is reflecting on his own roots in English history. He's thinking about writing his own autobiography and really delving into the mysteries of his Puritan forebears. And he wrote, what has preserved this race of Adamses in all their ramifications, in such numbers, health, peace, comfort, and mediocrity? I believe it is religion without which they would have been rakes, fops, sots, gamblers, starved with hunger, frozen with cold, scalped by Indians, been melted away and disappeared. Now, far from disappearing, we know that this family became important politicians, artists, writers, cultural critics, you name it, they were at the forefront of so many major social, cultural, and political changes over the course of three centuries. So I really felt like John Adams was throwing me a lead from 1812. I seized on his cue and I started to look into the history of the family's religion. So why study this family's religion? Why look again at such a well-known group of New Englanders who are prominent white elites and who have left us just so much material. Um, why should we look through that again? Well, a couple of reasons, if you're looking at how to chart changes in American religion. First off, it lets us explore greater structural changes in society. What did churches mean as institutions? How did individuals in America navigate personal identity with belonging to a greater community, right? The really, I think, fundamental question of how to be an American that shaped, and we're still talking about today. The second thing I wanted to do, amplify the voices of the laity. Often when we look at the sweep of American religious history, our stars are celebrity innovators in the pulpit, so really well-known preachers. They're voluntary associations. They're people who are tinged with scandal or controversial literature, which I'm going to talk about more in a moment. But we don't hear enough about the people in the pews. And what if we prioritized those voices instead? So this family, because they lived and prayed and told, gave me a really good door into the past of understanding how that worked. Thirdly, the Adamses are rarely home. They are often abroad as diplomats and wives of diplomats. They are all over the world, and their first thought when they think of religion is not to master theology. They're not terribly interested in dogma or theological nuances. They're interested in using religion as a key to understand and access foreign cultures. They also use religion when they come back home to critique their own New England religion. So we have these very loud kind of history guides in the Adamses, um, these very eloquent cultural interpreters who travel far and wide and talk about it. And then finally, I wanted to kind of show the development of what I call a cosmopolitan Christianity. This idea that people can travel, they can learn about religions from one another, and they come back to their kind of home base. In this case, for the Adamses, it's Puritanism, it's Congregationalism, it's Unitarianism, and they can really be skillful in refining it for the next generation. So let's say you want to explore a 300 year history of religion. Fortunately, we have the archives for it. I wanna say a word here because finding that John Adams letter about religion was truly a needle in the haystack moment for me. And I want to just zoom out for a moment and tell you just a little bit about the collection it comes from. So the Adams family papers came here at the turn of the 20th century, and they're well over a quarter of a million manuscript pages comprising the public and private letters, diaries, letter books, account books, later on photographs, and some very very experimental poetry, which I will also talk about in a moment, um, that the Adamses have left us, mostly John and Abigail and their descendants. So the bulk of the collection is really late 18th through 19th century. Um, 
And the Adamses have kind of this Forrest Gump-like ability to always be in really interesting, pivotal moments in American history. They are always um, available to be there and to comment and to guide events. Here are just a few that you might see. And you'll see some familiar Adamses, John and Abigail at the top, um, their daughter, Nabby, with the fabulous hat to the left, John Quincy, her brother, to the right, um, and then their kids as follows. Um, so when I first started looking into the family history, I started where a lot of people start when they're trying to understand questions of genealogy, religion, history, just how a family lived in America and made their way. I started in a cemetery. I went straight to the first parish church in Quincy, and I went to the cemetery to see this gravestone, which is the first monument that John Adams creates for his Puritan ancestor, Henry Adams. And I know that nothing was for sure in their minds about their Puritan ancestry, except that it gave them a really wonderful model for revolution. The actual biography is not quite right. And here's something anyone who's encountered church histories and American religious history can relate to. This monument has got a lot of mistakes. So the first thing you might notice is that Henry Adams took his flight from the dragon persecution. Scholars can't agree on what that was. It says he left from Devonshire. He left from Somerset, a completely different part of England. It says that there are eight sons. There are seven plus a daughter who actually emigrate. So there's a very hazy idea in John Adams' mind about who his own Puritan ancestor is. And that's where I began my story. And what I can tell you for sure about Henry Adams, who is the English Adams, again, who comes over and lands in what's then Braintree, I can tell you three things for sure. He brewed good beer. He was a malt maker. He read widely. He had a very impressive library of old books that he willed to his daughter and his sons, and he married well. So he marries the granddaughter of a rector, and to, when he does that, he picks up about 40-odd acres of land um, in Southeast England, where he's able to expand and kind of have a local brewery empire. So he's doing fairly well for himself at this point. Um, but remember those three things, because they're going to be problematic in just a moment. I want to show you here Barton St. David. This is kind of the English home place of the Adamses. And you'll notice that right away, this is the church, very standard, cramped. Um, it would have, you know, four church bells that would peel out for holidays that would summon Henry Adams and his friends from the three places that were considered kind of the circuit of life, the schoolroom, the meeting house, the militia field. That's kind of the, the circuit that he lived in. Um, you can see over on the left-hand side, there's a very weather-beaten statue of St. David collecting alms. Um, and you can kind of see where this is located in England in the map on the right-hand side. Now, the Adamses from the get-go are really rooted in Protestantism. And the Reformation takes root itself easily in this neighborhood. It seems to be something that is going really well, very smoothly, I have to say, in terms of the religious landscape for the Adamses, until the 1630s. And the 1630s brings a wave of reform, thanks to a new Archbishop of Canterbury named William Laud. When William Laud comes in, he makes some major changes that Church of England folk like Henry Adams and his wife Edith just don't like. He wants to take communion, tables and rail them. And this seems to invite genuflection, something that seems Catholic and therefore abhorrent to Henry and his friends. He wants to create power for the bishops and a stronger clergy and a weaker laity. He likes to impose different kinds of surveillance. So he has deacons do conduct reports um, on people like Henry and Edith. And if you want a sample of what these conduct reports are like, they might go something along the lines like, did Henry remember to kneel during this part of the service? Did Edith, a mother, mother of nine, remember to wear a veil when she went back to church after childbirth? So all of these little things start to accrue. The surveillance, the feeling that there is perhaps a Roman Catholic taint to services, and Henry and his friends start to push back 
Um, they push back in different ways, but one of the biggest ways they're going to push back is by thinking about leaving, right? So thinking about emigration, of taking their fortunes elsewhere. At this moment, we can see how family networks are so important for the course of American religious history, because what the Adamses do is they start to listen to and hear the preaching of men like John White. And John White is a man who never leaves England and yet does a whole lot for sending about 21,000 folks there during the Great Migration between 1630 and 1640, because he advocates that there is a providential moment happening. There is a moment in which England has such a rotten moral climate to stay in England means that you are going to grow further from heaven. And so in order to really ameliorate your chances of salvation, it's best to get your family together, cross the Atlantic, and head for conversion opportunities in greener pastures in America. And this is what he says in all of these kind of pamphlets and sermons that are dispersed, including the one you see here, the planter's plea. Now, if you're curious about what happens to William Laud, fate turns on him. Um, and if you're following along the little CLA primary source playlist I created, you can check out um, his own little history of his troubles and trials, which land him in the Tower of London. So I'll just leave that as a little teaser for you to, to check out and follow up in the reading room yourself. Um, but I want to just focus for a moment on this word that I mentioned a minute ago, providential, because it's super critical. This is kind of the big idea, the big arc of the book, which is the life and death of providentialism as an idea that guides the American mind and the American government for some time, really from the 17th century all the way until it's violently shattered by the American Civil War. This is the idea that there is an omniscient God that hovers over the pages of history and turns them, occasionally interfering in human events to fulfill a predestined plan. This idea of providence is so central to the Adamses that when you search the Adams Papers digital editions, if you want to look up religion, don't look for God or Christ or Jesus, search for providence because that's what they're doing all the time. The second part of accepting this idea is always trying to detect lowercase p providences, little signs of divine will that pop up throughout your day. Um, and the Adamses are always keen to note these down in their papers. So that's certainly something to, to keep looking for. Once the Adamses have arrived in America, it's a very different story, and I love looking at these kind of different versions of the church that they would have experienced. So first we have kind of the Barton St. David model, which you saw a moment ago. Those are the first two pictures. Then the next one you see is their first kind of Puritan meeting house that they would have experienced in Braintree, and it sits at the fording of two major brooks. This is done on purpose so that when rudimentary highways are built in the late 17th century to this area, you are literally covenanted physically. You are coming from two different directions and you are meeting in common sacred ground in congregation to do the will of providence. Um, and so this is a much simpler structure, right? It's kind of sealed off with mud corners. It's a two-tiered wooden structure. It would be very simple and plain inside. It would double as the place for surgeries and trials and you name it. So it's a very kind of um, universal place for people to work through all kinds of covenants, whether they're sacred or secular. And the last image, of course, is what the family church will become. This is the first parish church in Quincy, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Before we go to John and Abigail, I just want to point out how very different the experience would have been for Henry and Edith Ammons once they've kind of arrived in Braintree. It would no longer be church bells peeling out. They would look for kind of the flutter of a red silk flag or a solo drummer in the town square, and that would guide them to worship. Um, it's, it's immediately different, um, and that's something I really tried to capture when I was writing Household Gods and researching it, the sensory worlds that they moved through and how their experience of worship changed so greatly. So let's move on from the Puritans a little bit. and Let's jump toward a very familiar scene, um, John Adams and his dearest friend, Abigail. 
I love talking about John Adams always, but I especially love talking about him and his development as what he called being a church going animal. So here's someone who, as a young man, has three forks in the road in terms of his career. The major jobs that you could pursue in New England in this period, he could be in medicine, ministry, or law. So medicine he wants no part of. Ministry intrigues him. And when he goes to Harvard, originally, he's there to study to be a minister. But something happens that changes his mind. And this is the moment that he will always pin to Providence in his reflections as the moment that he was guided away from the pulpit and toward the law. And I thought when I started Household Gods that I would have this really interesting moment where they would comment on the big moments in American history. I would have evangelical awakenings. I would have some really big ruptures denominationally. They would comment on all the big stuff, and they sometimes do. But what I learned from young John Adams, really teenage John Adams, is that local history can be epic. And sometimes it's the smallest local story that you don't expect that illuminates greater change. I think immediately of you know the, the material, the riches available in New England's hidden histories when I'm talking about this, because there are so many great kind of capsule biographies and stories that can bloom to life um, just from a local level. In any event, his home church um, in Quincy gets a new minister. And it's a new minister who's a little older than he is, but they get along great. They're both of kind of the same humor. It's this 24-year-old rookie preacher named Lemuel Bryan. And Lemuel Bryan comes in blazing with a new idea that is kind of a century or so ahead of his time. What he's championing is the idea of what we call now Arminianism. And this is the thought, the, the path really, that a providence offers a path to grace, but you can freely accept or reject it because you have free will. And this idea is really appealing to John Adams. He really likes this idea. Some people in the congregation do, some others don't, and a nasty pamphlet war ensues. So every time John Adams comes home for the weekend from Harvard, he is following this debate back and forth and back and forth. And he is on Bryant's side. Some of the congregation ends up just narrowly saving Bryant's job. But Bryant's health is broken and he dies a very young man a year or two later. And this persuades John Adams that the worst thing he could possibly do is because become a minister, because ministers are not well treated by their communities. It's going to be far better and friendlier, he thinks, to become a lawyer. Now, this might seem kind of funny to us, but we should think about it from an 18th century perspective, because in the law, John Adams, thinking like an 18th century man, is the idea that the law is a spiritual and moral corrective to society. This is the way that you heal and fix wrongs. So he very much sees it as a profession that providence has steered him toward. Um, so here's a little bit of John Adams reflecting on providence once the revolution has begun, once he has embedded his political literature, you know, the, the likes of the Navangus letters and his dissertation on the canon and feudal law, once he's embedded those with some of that heft of Puritan history, the idea that you can rise up to royal oppression with providential aid. Um, but I, I kind of love this letter a great deal because it shows that providentialism is the language he uses at home too with his family. This is how he and Abigail are going to make good sense of what happens during the war when they are apart so often. Um, now, Abigail's slightly different. Her religious backstory is actually quite a bit different than John's. They're not always a package deal on things. She grows up as a parson's daughter in Weymouth, one town over, and it is busy, busy, busy. So she is constantly helping with disputes over town property. She helps to rebuild portions of the community after a bad fire. And then she marries John Adams and she's launched into a life that neither of them expected um, in terms of their revolutionary activity. 
once the war is over, that providentialism doesn't exactly fade when she goes abroad to Europe. But she is changed because her version of providence is one who also focuses the finer brushstrokes of the arts. So she sees God and enjoys religion in music, in art, in the aesthetic experience of going to Europe. She has <clears throat> more than one letter that she writes about hearing a Te Deum with Thomas Jefferson at Notre Dame. She is enchanted by Handel's Messiah. And when the, the Hallelujah Chorus comes on, she says, I was one continued shudder from beginning to end. Um, so Abigail, who is not, you know, an incredibly demonstrative person, she's very much a frugal, plain Jane New Englander, is dazzled by the religious aesthetics of Europe. She is, however, a good example of what we might think of as Enlightenment Christianity, of someone who's trying to blend together the newest science and the oldest religion and kind of make it work in her head. She's also a fine illustration of the Adams penchant for not caring about theology or dogma and being more interested in religion as a part of culture. Here she is saying, you know, what can we reason but from what we know? So jumping ahead to the next generation, <clears throat> we have John Quincy Adams and Louisa Catherine, and they're a really good example of a major change in American history at this moment, this early part of the 19th century, um, because they are technically an interdenominational marriage. So Louisa Catherine is an Anglo-American who grows up in the shadow of the Tower of London, um, just in Tower Hamlets there. They're nominally Unitarian. They occasionally attend Church of England her as, as a child. She has a very kind of ramshackle religious education. She is in a Unitarian school, then she's sent to a Catholic school and not. <clears throat> when she comes back to the Unitarian school, she has a fainting fit and threatens to not go back again. Um, and that works for about a month. And then they send her back and she has a second fainting fit. And they say, nope, you're staying in school. Um, so she has a very kind of fraught relationship with religion. But one of the things that I absolutely loved in Louise's story was her outright linkage to themes of Marian compassion and Roman Catholicism. And I was surprised to see how much this cropped up as she was traveling through the courts of Europe with her brand new husband, John Quincy. It was also a running motif throughout her life as she suffered from illness and miscarriages. Now, John Quincy Adams has a slightly different story. He is, for sure, one of the most well-traveled statesmen by the time he's a teenager, right? So he spent time in Europe. He spent time back in America. He is off to Russia um, very shortly after launching his diplomatic career. And the thing about John Quincy Adams is he is a master diarist. You've got to love that handwriting, which you can read and transcribe his diaries. They're all easily available on the MHS website. But he is also very, very curious about exploring other faiths. So he explores Russian Orthodox faiths and Judaism and Catholicism, especially while he's in Russia, which he finds to be way more diverse as a religious marketplace than New England, and he's kind of dazzled by it, to be honest. Um, he is a little concerned about his children's own religious education. This will be a theme over the course of the Adams's lives from generation to generation. They're often apart from their kids, and they're worried that they're just not getting the providential training they need. So in one case, he writes this really pedantic set of letters on the Bible to his young sons who are far away in New England. And he tells them there are basically four ways to read the Bible. One, you should know that it's historical record. Second, it's divine revelation. Third, it's a system of morality. And fourth, it is an unparalleled literary composition. Now, John Quincy Adams himself gets up every morning, reads his Bible in one of four or five different languages that he knows. And he often marks it up in his diary what he's read. But he often struggles with it in his diary too. This was really relatable and interesting for me to read because he often has passages where he'll kind of fight with the scripture. He'll say, 
there's a lot of the Bible hard to understand, and it's not my fault. Look, for example, what St. Peter says about Paul's epistles. So there's this opportunity for JQA to use his diary to work out some of those feelings. He also uses it to draft some of his poetry, which is deeply experimentally romantic and religious in nature. And his edits, his line edits are fascinating because he'll have kind of back and forths between his relationship to God and his relationship to his constituency, which is an interesting thing to see. So within his diary, probably one of the standout pieces is his crafting of a Christian conscience in light of his need to be an anti-slavery advocate. And here I'm thinking particularly of his defense of the Amistad Mendy captives in 1841. And this idea that no one else will undertake it, that you need a certain kind of spirit to do it, that there is an almighty God, a providence one might say, who is willing to back you in it, no matter how old he is and how out of power it will force him to be. So I think this is really interesting because this diary entry, which looks so neat and tidy, has so much emotional force in it in terms of how he's thinking through how to be really a Christian patriot at a moment when the parties are so divergent, the country is so riven over slavery, and it is such a tumultuous period of time in American history. Everything is on the move, people, ideas, and goods, and his background is beginning to feel very far away. John Adams is gone. Abigail is gone. It is a whole new era. And I think that's just super interesting to read. So here we are with the Adams timeline again, and we will briskly move through the Victorian so that we can get to some questions and comments. And we're going to head to Queen Victoria's court for a little while, um, just to, to take a break from New England. So here are John Quincy's son, Charles Francis, and his wife, Abigail Brooks Adams. And this photo is actually taken by their daughter-in-law, Clover, um, which is always an interesting kind of, I don't know if it tells you more about the photographer from the, the posing or if it tells you more about them. Um, but Charles Francis is sort of a thwarted man of letters and law. He very much wants to go into the business of being a congressman and getting on the road to the White House, but he doesn't as well. And so when his father, John Quincy, comes back after the presidency to be a congressman, it's a little bit of a relief, but it's a little bit annoying. <clears throat> so Charles Francis builds a slightly different life for himself. He becomes a statesman, that's the family trade, and he and his wife have a fairly large and fairly wealthy um family at this moment. Abigail Brooks is the youngest daughter of the richest man in Boston, and her wealth transforms the family in the American kind of Civil War era. <clears throat> so they have this large family, and I, I like to think of them in Peacefield as kind of our classic Victorians. Abigail sets out in the front foyer a gilded Bible that's just kind of a, a welcome and a signpost to people coming in to let them know what kind of a home it is. She is adroit at drilling her, her children in reciting prayers and singing hymns. She maintains some of the Christian patriotism and providentialist touches she inherited from John and Abigail. So if you go up to the second floor of Peacefield, when you visit the Adams National Historical Park, and you look into Brooks Adams's bedroom, you will see little Dutch tiles um, that Abigail kept in there that relay scripture stories at a child's height. So before they can read, they're being indoctrinated in what it's like to grow up in a Christian home. And Abigail Brooks takes very seriously this idea that she is kind of the Christian matriarch running the home, much like a lot of women of her era. Now, Charles Francis sometimes needs to go on pilgrimage. Like any good Christian, he needs to get away from it all in order to get closer to God. And so he travels to places that are incredibly popular in the 19th century, but have like a little bit of a twist. So he goes to Niagara Falls, which at the time is kind of tricked out as a Protestant amusement park. 
It's where there are little hermits that can pop out. It's where you can buy kind of magical staffs in order to experience the beautiful and sublime of going to the top of the falls. Um, and it's got some Catholic and indigenous touches that are especially interesting. He goes to Canada after that to see if what he'd read in Mariah Monk's um, little racy disclosures of what it's like to be a nun is actually true. He's very disappointed that it's not. Um, he thinks that it's more of a, a prophet maker with a P-R-O-F-I-T than anything else and less about prophecy. So he's a little disconcerted by that. Another place that Charles Francis ventures to in his downtime is into the West and he meets Joseph Smith, um, Mormon founder. He is incredibly taken by Smith's ability to consolidate local power on the ground. He's fascinated by that. He thinks that that is the thing that is going to be the Western religion archetype in a nutshell. Um, and whether or not he's right, I couldn't say, but he he's very taken by some of the precepts that are argued. He doesn't get it quite right. He doesn't quite understand what he's hearing theologically, but he doesn't care because for him, it's a way to understand Western culture. When the Adamses go to London, this is really where Charles Francis Adams finds his Anglophilia ascendant because he starts to go on a mission to find every Christopher Wren church he can find and document it. Um, so you see some of that here a little bit, but he's trying to understand the relationship between religion and the city, between monuments and power. And I think it's it's really kind of fascinating because that visual encapsulation of London in that moment is so valuable to us as historians. I went to as many places as I could possibly find um, that the Adamses went for, for religion. And looking through for some of these churches, they were ruined in the Blitz. And all I had was Charles Francis's kind of sensory landscape of what they looked like. And that was, that was amazing um, to, to really understand. Charles Francis does less well as a Sunday school teacher, a gig that he has, and he really does not excel at. Um, his children, he is really depressed to find. Something that guts him to the core is that his kids are not as interested in religion and religious education as he will be for the rest of his life. They have lost that kind of thread of interest. In some ways, this does mirror what's happening in the latter part of the 19th century, in a widespread way, right? So there's more interest in religions that are Eastern or in ideas of atheism or ideas of philosophy being ascendant over religion or science. These are all attractive themes to his kids, but not to Charles Francis. And he is, he's quite kind of broken up about this. <clears throat> so just before we head into questions, I wanna leave you with kind of the final crowning generation who we introduced in the last few chapters of the book. And that's Henry Adams and Clover Adams and Henry's brother in a moment, Brooks. So Henry, we probably know from the education, um, a vibrant cultural critic, a brilliant writer, someone who embraced um, to a great degree Eastern religion, thanks to his travels throughout India, throughout Japan, um, Russia. This was someone who had the means to be kind of a freelance historian and independent scholar forever, no holds barred, and really went for it. Um, he becomes such an eloquent critic of church and state, yet at the same time, he resurrects the medieval world for us in a whole new way. He thinks of religion as something that is a dusty artifact, but even an artifact is useful for understanding people in the past. So he trains that lens on French Catholic life um, rather than American religion. And we see here kind of the, the two books that he's probably best known for are The Education and Mont Saint-Michel. And I will happily argue that The Education is a gambit. It is a test to see if his methodology will fly. It's a game. It is the least true thing he ever writes. However, Mont Saint-Michel is his real autobiography. And if you wanna know more about kind of his relationship between religion past and present and what he thought it could do for a scholar, 
that's the book to read. There's one more book here, and that's a book that no one knew he wrote when he wrote it. It's a book called Esther, and he wrote it for his wife, Clover. Clover was a gifted and troubled photographer who committed suicide in 1885 um, after her father's death. Esther was a book that Henry wrote anonymously. He said he wrote it you know, in his heart's blood because he was trying so hard to kind of show Clover that there was a future um, with or without religion, which is, you know, something that's important to know about Clover is that she was along Henry's lines in terms of kind of turning away from mainstream religion. And then finally, you'll see the St. Gaudens monument at Rock Creek that Henry created for her. And he asked for something Buddhist and slightly anarchic um, to commemorate her as well. So Henry gives us a wonderful gift in the Adams papers. He gives us photographs. Everywhere he goes, he takes pictures or he has pictures made of different religious scenes. And we really get to see a 19th century world gone by here. We see someone who is kind of passing yet still pulling at understanding what they see, especially in his scenes of Buddhist worship here in Japan. Finally, we have his brother Brooks Adams and his wife Evelyn, who is prominent in the Episcopal Church here in Boston. Um, Brooks, again, settles in the home parish um, in Quincy. So going back 300 years almost, same, same church in Quincy, the first parish church, but he really looks at that Puritan ancestry anew in the emancipation of Massachusetts and in his law of civilization decay even to a little bit. And here he is kind of on holiday in India. He is eternally fascinated by Roman Catholicism and he often writes that he could just leap the chasm, he would, but there is something about Unitarianism and its Congregationalist principles that keeps pulling him back again and again. Um, so we have kind of an interesting arc. It takes this family 300 years to settle down and commit to one American religion. And even then they remain these Christian, curious, cosmopolitan folks. And here is just a taste of Brooks who can be quite acidic um, in terms of what he thinks is the true problem, which is priestcraft in early Massachusetts. So who are the household gods? I'll end with this so that we can get to the Q&A because I think it's worth knowing that we wouldn't know much about the household gods except for Brooks. And that's why I like to put this one here. Um, so these are six busts of Cicero, Homer, Plato, Virgil, Socrates, and Demosthenes that sit in the Stone Library. John Quincy Adams purchased them in 1815 in Paris. Just pick them up on a spree. And they have always been either in the White House when the Adamses were in a White House, or they have always been there or here in Peacefield. The idea is that they always sit on the mantle and the household gods, just like the beliefs that they carry of many different faiths or the ideas that they have that give them the courage to start up a republic again in the middle of the night, just like Virgil's Aeneas did, um, will always be there for them. And I kind of like that we can think about the Adams's religion as something that travels with them, that they pick up and carry along. It's always portable and it's always changing. So with that, I will stop sharing and I will turn it over to Kyle. Um, you know, in starting off, I love your use of this, this line of providence and providentialism. And and, and I'm curious if you're finding the atoms are just a good lens for a larger American phenomenon or, or it could be an and or, is there something distinctive about this family that lives in one house <laughs> for such a long time? You, you mentioned in the book so nicely, and I think you've alluded to it tonight, they're often retelling their own story, mm. right? that they're they're their own interpreter of past generations. So is there something that just inhered in the Adam's DNA to be really interested in the idea of providentialism? You know, so is it is it is it just reflective of a larger phenomenon or is there something interesting going on with the Adams? 
Yeah, and I mean, you're right. The Adamses do write for the archive, very deliberately so. They know that their words will be read. In fact, when you apprentice kind of as a junior Adams, you're expected to read your father's diary and your mother's letters. So let that sink in for a moment, because when they sit down to write, yeah, that's why they put Providence in. There is kind of that moment of religious education and indoctrination that they're trying to imprint, I guess, on the kids. As for whether or not the Adamses are unique or representative, there's no such thing as a representative American, right? So I, I think that, you know, that's that's something to consider, but there's certainly evidence that providence is kind of the language of the moment all the way through the revolution, really peaks in the revolution. And then the, the beginning of the 19th century, we start to see other language, right? And some of that shattering has to do with the Civil War because Henry Adams, who is a teenager during the Civil War, tries to default to this providential language, and it does not work for him. It is something where he tries to use that old language, and he can't believe it. The Civil War shows him that providence doesn't exist, because what kind of God would let this slaughter happen? What kind of God would side with North or South? And, and I think that's that's really important that it's such a time bound moment. I think that happens for a lot of people um, in this period, because coming out of the Civil War, the word Providence just drops away. And you see that in newspaper articles. You see it in fiction, which is a wonderful place to look. Right. Look at novels to see how people imagine God. Um, and it's a little more widespread than just the family, I think. But they certainly are adroit at using this language. I, I'm just, you know, I marvel at when you start a project like this, you know, you gave us your, your this, that wonderful quote that really sort of got you thinking about it, but also the point at which you've done enough research to have seen the thread, right, to be able to pull out and say, oh, that's what this is about, you know, that's what this telling is, um, and I just want to, you know, congratulate you for doing Thank it you. You know, so engagingly. Uh, great question here uh, from Michael Moore, you know, I think it's fair to say that Protestant New England was pretty rapidly anti-Catholic uh, mm -hmm. in the 17th and 18th centuries. And so Michael asks, you know, what was it like for John Adams to become the ambassador to Catholic France? You know, he would have seen in his own lifetime Puritans, Congregationalists fighting for their faith against Catholics in the French and Indian or Seven Years' War. What... It feels like if we're going to take very seriously, which I think you help us really do, the milieu in which they come up, how did he navigate, you know, uh, what would be probably the, the something that he even told that he shouldn't be now? Awkwardly. I mean, really? that, very awkwardly. I think that he did not expect to become a diplomat and his French is not great. So <laughs> automatically he's a fish out of water when he gets to Versailles, right? And he's he's not exactly got the flash, sizzle, and charm of a Franklin who's already set up shop there. So that's something that kind of works against him. I don't think that he was particularly concerned with any kind of Catholic doings in France because that court is not gonna be super overly religious in any case. The other thing is that he is very good friends with some important Huguenots, right? So you think about someone like John Jay, that's a Huguenot family. Um, the Lawrence family has relations there. So there's a long strain of kind of um, different, I guess, Franco-American professionals that he's known. He is not one to comment on it. The person who comments big time on French religion is Abigail. Hmm. And so she likes how it looks and it sounds and it smells, even though it is, and the most common slang here is Romish, right? In the Adams letters, not Catholic or Roman Catholic, it's a Romish um, or sacerdotal. Like you get all kinds of kind of slang to talk about it. So Abigail at first glance really enjoys parts of French religion, kind of the pretty gilded parts. Um, then she goes back and she gets a little confused. She doesn't quite understand why French churches are open all day. This is a new thing for her. She doesn't like kind of the hard clatter of schoolboys going in and out of the pews and just kind of like dumping down to kneel and not really paying attention to things. 
She doesn't understand whispering through a grate for confession. That's something she finds kind of silly. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing that she kind of <laughs> slams the door on in terms of her appreciation for French religion, French Catholic religion, is um, how damp and dirty the churches are. She really feels like they could have kept up the cathedrals better. Um, and she does She does kind of go off on that. And it's, it's very much kind of a, a prickly New Englander, like could have kept their meeting house tidy. Um, and so she is, she's really interesting to read because she likes some parts of it, but the whole experience doesn't quite gel for her. What I do appreciate is that they're awkward but honest when they're encountering these religions. Like they're trying very hard to understand people who are very different. Um, and they just get that, you know, this is how it's done here. There's some kind of statecraft to that that they both develop. I can't think of anybody better situated to tell this story than you as the series editor of the Adams Papers, um, as somebody who can hop on the red line and go down to the Adams family property and see the Stone Library. But I got to ask a self-interested question. How did the Congregational Library and Archives help you with this story? So many ways. We have a playlist all about it. Um, <laughs> so here's the thing about the Congregational Library and Archives. There are untold riches if you start in the 20th century and work your way backward, which is what I did. I think often people begin in the beginning. Um, there's no logic like chronologic, but I did it a little backwards. And I first clicked into really the CLA's resources, I think, when I was working on Brooks Adams. And I was trying to understand that early 20th century series of events for congregationalism and Unitarianism. I knew the early 19th century story, and that's really well documented. And then I was like, but wait, what happens a century later? And so I started in one place looking at the relationship between how elite Unitarian heirs remodel their Puritan ancestry in their brain, looking really at Peggy Bendroth's excellent scholarship on this and tracking back through that, looking at the words covenant and commonwealth in a 20th century version. And your library catalog just buzzed and sprang to life. And I thought, well, maybe I should go back and keep looking through. <laughs> and so that's how I kind of got into looking at New England's hidden histories, which was great for kind of giving a broad sweep of the landscape um, mm -hmm. and helping me understand that, which I, I don't think I would have been able to do. It was also super helpful in terms of understanding William Laud, who is, is mm -hmm. such a wily character. Um, and you have some really fabulous 17th century material that contextualizes him. Um, I'm not sure everyone knows the secret about CLA, but it has fantastic primary and secondary sources. So when you're there, pull it all, read it all. Um, I highly recommend checking that out. But the playlist is available for all. Absolutely. And it's uh, we'll send it around as well to all the attendees and registrants. And mm -hmm. Congregational Library and Archives is open from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, for all of you who want to come down and research. As a final question, we're kind of hitting the end of our time here, um, but a, a great one that I love here in the chat. What family could you also have done this story about? Oh, is that a volunteer? Um, <laughs> because there's so many great family histories. When I first looked at this project, it looked very different the first time around. It had a, for my Southern family, I was thinking maybe the Lees. I was thinking of maybe a Western family. I was going to flip in time and do maybe the Stowe's. Yeah. Um, so I thought about that. I also thought about doing... Um, an English family, an American family, like did any Adamses stick around in Barton St. David and could I kind of compare? No. Um, but what I decided was that I really wanted to tell it through this one archive because they so, they purpose built it for a running thread like this. Um, a comparative piece would be interesting, but I felt like it might be kind of unwieldy. There's a lot of people here already and they all kind of have the same last name. So you, you want to you want to kind of bring that together. Um, I also wanted it to be about a family that was at the heart of political power. Mm -hmm. How do presidents pray? Like 
how, did they write down the Bible verse before they they go to Congress about something? I mean, like this was something that I just really wanted to know about. So I kept a very tight focus um, for that reason. That being said, anyone can do this with any family. Hmm. So I encourage people, you know, when's that reading room open, Kyle? Uh, <laughs> I encourage people to explore the CLA resources, to think about, you know, researching a family's religion. One of the great pleasures of taking household gods on book tour has been that at the signing table, people often come up and tell me all their family history of religion. And mm -hmm. that is just magical for a historian. Um, so keep them coming. And I think you've so wonderfully shown that the generational story is so important, right? That there is such a long story there that we don't need to just focus on, you know, John Adams, or we don't need to just focus on Henry Adams, which people might be coming to, you know, from a literary perspective, that telling this long durée story is really quite- They fantastic. change, don't they? Like when you put them back in their place and time and you think about them as a family, they really change. And these people who seem so familiar become even more compelling, which makes me say the Adams family papers are open for research here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. So come on down to our reading room as well. So as you plan your, re your research trips for the summer, one day at CLA, one day at MHS, it'll be great. Uh, well, thank you all so much for joining us today for this fantastic talk. A round of virtual applause to Dr. Giorgini for a fantastic talk. And Thank we'll you. see you all soon. Take care. Thank you all.